Africans and Neanderthals. There's a recent article by uh, Price in Science Short article called Africans to Carry Neanderthal Genetic Legacy. And interestingly enough, if you look on the web, you can find a summary of it. Uh, but when you turn to the article itself, the summary has disappeared. So um, the summary is available there. The uh, article itself, I think, is not available without a subscription to the uh, to science or else to um, uh, or else uh, availability at a library. And uh, the subtitle of the article is, is Ancient Europeans Took Neanderthal DNA Back to Africa. Uh, of course that raises some interesting questions as to exactly how and maybe we'll discuss that briefly at the end. Um, this is fresh 2020 the summary uh, goes, for the first time, significant and widespread sequences of Neanderthal ancestry have been detected in modern African populations. It was widely assumed that Africans possessed little DNA, Neanderthal DNA because modern humans only interbred with them once, migrating out of Africa. And of course, then everything went out from Africa that way. Yet, by using a new statistical model that estimates whether stretches of modern DNA are inherited from an ancient reference population, in this case Neanderthals, the researchers behind a new study learned that five widespread African subpopulations each contained about 17 megabases of DNA inherited from Neanderthals, making up about 0.3 of their percent of their genomes. Africans owed this shared Neanderthal ancestry to a relatively recent back migration of Europeans as well as a much earlier failed out of Africa migration more than 100,000 years ago that introduced human DNA into Neanderthals. Now, as a creationist, uh, your ears should prick up a little bit about this failed out of Africa migration more than 100,000 years ago. Uh, but uh, We'll continue on and we'll see their point of view and then we'll try to make sense out of it. Um, oh, this did that. For 10 years, geneticists, this is the actual article, have told the story of how Neanderthals, or at least their DNA sequences, live on in today's Europeans, Asians, and their descendants. Not so in Africans, the story goes, because modern humans and our extinct cousins interbred only outside of Africa, a new study overturns that notion, revealing an unexpectedly large amount of Neanderthal ancestry in modern populations across Africa. It suggests much of that DNA came from Europeans migrating back into Africa over the past 20,000 years. That gene flow with Neanderthals exists in all modern humans inside and outside of Africa is a novel and elegant finding, says anthropologist Michael Petroglia of the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History. The work reported in this week's issue of Cell could also help clear up a mysterious disparity. Why East Asians appear to have more Neanderthal ancestry than Europeans. Which doesn't make a lot of sense because Neanderthals live mostly in Europe and it would seem that that would be where you would interbreed. As members of Homo sapiens spread from Africa into Eurasia some 70,000 years ago, and take that with a grain of salt, they met and mingled with Neanderthals. Researchers know that later back migrations of Europeans had introduced a bit of Neanderthal DNA into African populations, but previous work suggested it was just a smidgen. In contrast, modern Europeans and East Asians apparently inherited about 2% of their DNA from Neanderthals. Previous efforts simply assumed that Africans largely lack Neanderthal DNA. Ooh. So if you assume that they lack the, uh, Neanderthal DNA, then when you go f looking for it, you might you use tools that assume that, and you might confirm your assumption. 
Part of the reason that I'm bringing this to you today is because I want you to realize that the top scientists in many areas, and in particular sensitive areas, whatever that is, um, uh, sometimes uh, wind up uh, making kind of elementary assumptions that they don't think about. That because you're on the, the top person in a field doesn't mean you're always right. Or the, even that you are using the right tools. To get more reliable numbers, Princeton University evolutionary biologist Joshua Akey and colleagues uh, compared the genome of a Neanderthal from Russia's Altai region in Siberia, sequenced in 2013, to 2,504 modern genomes uploaded to the Thousand Genome product, uh, Project. So they've now got more than a thousand genomes. A catalog of genomes from around the world that includes five African subpopulations. The researchers then calculated the probability that each stretch of DNA was inherited from a Neanderthal ancestor. About 50,000 bases at a time, as we'll find out. The researchers found that African individuals on average had significantly more Neanderthal DNA than previously thought, about 17 megabases worth, or 0.3% of their genome. They also found signs that a handful of Neanderthal genes may have been selected for after they entered Africans' genomes, including genes that boost immune function and protect against ultraviolet radiation. See, um, those, geno those genes may have been helpful if you're in Africa, and therefore your kids do better, and therefore they, uh, uh, those genes spread in the population. The results jibe with as yet unpublished work by Sarah Tishkoff, an evolutionary geneticist at the University of Pennsylvania. She told Science that she has also found higher than expected levels of apparent Neanderthal DNA in Africans. So this assumption that Africans didn't have Neanderthal DNA turned out to be an erroneous assumption. The best fit model which means there may be some other model that's actually more accurate, but this is the one that, uh, that the statistics fit best with. For where Africans got all this Neanderthal DNA suggests about half of it came from Europe, when Europeans, who had Neanderthal DNA from previous matings, migrated back to Africa in the past 20,000 years. The model suggests that the rest of the DNA shared by Africans in the Altai Neanderthal might not be Neanderthal at all. Instead, it may be DNA from early modern humans that was simply retained in both Africans and Eurasians and was picked up by Neanderthals. Perhaps when moderns made a failed migration from Africa to the Middle East more than 100,000 years ago. Well, yes. Uh, how do they tell it's Neanderthal uh, DNA compared to the rest of the ordinary DNA. I, I'm, I'm missing a point here. In okay. How this is done. Well, to be very specific, the Altai Neanderthal, which is a woman from Siberia who had a small toe that they were able to get good DNA out of. Um, and of course, Siberia is a nice place to keep DNA because it stays cold a good share of the time. Um, uh, they compared that sequence with the sequences of modern uh, humans of various kinds in that 1,000 Genomes project, which is now 2,000 genomes and counting. Um, and uh, so they were able to say that in this particular case, some but not all humans have a long stretch of DNA that basically matches the Altai uh, Neanderthal. Uh, the truth of the matter is that if you read the paper, and it's, uh, I'll just make a comment now because uh, uh, it makes more sense to say it now and then say it later again, is that if you go over their 
a paper, you can get kind of the general idea of what they're doing. Uh, but the precise explanation is, uh, shall we say, not clear. Um, and so I think the paper could have been written a little better. Uh, although maybe that's me, not the paper, but we'll see. Uh, but that's the idea, is they basically they took the Altai uh, Neanderthals DNA and then they just compared it with DNA from various uh, people, including various groups. And because you could see where it's been inherited kind of lock, stock, and barrel, you can say, well, that's relatively recent uh, introduction of Neanderthal DNA. Whereas if it's kind of chopped up into little pieces, that may be just simply common ancestor. And that's what they're trying to distinguish is the common ancestor from, um, from actual uh, reintroduction into a group where it had, uh, had been kind of fuzzed out and not mitochondrial genomes. Pardon me? This is a whole genome and not mitochondrial. Uh, this is whole genome, correct. Yeah. Yes. A key study might help explain another head scratcher. Studies had suggested East Asians had 20% more Neanderthal DNA than Europeans. The new study points to an explanation. Researchers previously assumed that Neanderthal sequences shared by Europeans and Africans were modern and therefore they didn't count and so subtracted them out. After correcting for that bias, the new study found similar amounts of Neanderthal DNA in European and Asians, 51 and 55 megabytes or megabases respectively. Yes. Uh, how <coughs> uniquely different, or has it been established, the so-called Neanderthal DNA is compared to modern human DNA? Are we talking 2% of the bases in a, in a long sequence, or just what? Well, we're 4% Neanderthal, so it must be 96% different. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, actually, it's very, very close, but there are certain characteristic mutations that are, are, or variants, because we don't know which was the original, uh, that were, uh, that are common in, in uh, the two or three Neanderthals that have actually been sequenced. I think there's one, uh, one in the cave in Yugoslavia or something like that that was. And this is from DNA from somatic cells. Well, it's DNA from toe bone, so uh, presumably it's somatic cells. Yeah, it's it, it's not it's not genital DNA. That that's long gone. Well, that's what that's what I suspected. So yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, I finally found the paper. Um, I think for a while they were keeping it off so that you couldn't search for it. But the other thing is that, that the, you'll notice that the paper that I just read didn't have any references and the part that I omitted didn't have any references either, which is kind of interesting, shall we say. Um, but I was able to identify the paper in the journal cell. And this one I think is on the internet without uh, having to go through the library. And nowadays, I guess they're quitting uh, calling them abstract, so we got a summary. Admixture has played a prominent role in shaping patterns of human genomic variation, including gene flow with now, now extinct hominins like Neanderthals and Denisovans. Uh, here we describe a novel probabilistic method called IBD mix to identify introgressed hominin sequences, which unlike existing approaches, does not use a modern reference population. We applied IDB, uh, pardon me, IBD mix to 2,504 individuals from geographically diverse populations to identify and analyze Neanderthal sequence 
practices segregating in modern humans. Strikingly, we find that African individuals carry a stronger signal of Neanderthal ancestry than previously thought. We show that this can be explained by genuine Neanderthal ancestry due to migrations back to Africa, predominantly from ancestral Europeans, and gene flow into Neanderthals from an early dispersing group of humans out of Africa. Our results refine our understanding of Neanderthal ancestry in African and non-African populations and demonstrate that remnants of Neanderthal genomes survive in every modern human population studied to date. We are all part Neanderthal. Uh, introduction. Studies of ancient DNA are transforming our understanding of human evolutionary history and in particular how admixture has shaped past and present patterns of human genomic variation. Of particular interest has been the discovery that admixture with archaic hominins occurred multiple times throughout human history. And there's some references behind that. In particular, t approximately 2% of all non-African ancestry, uh, and this is continuation of the same paragraph, I think, um, is derived from Neanderthals, with oceanic populations having an additional 2 to 4% of ancestry attributable to gene flow with Denisovans. The ability to identify introgressed hominin sequences in the genomes of modern humans enables inferences about the functional, evolutionary, and phenotypic significance of archaic admixture. For example, the genomic distribution of surviving Neanderthal and Denisovan lineages has, have, has been influenced by purifying selection. That is to say, it actually helps some things and so it's pulled into um, modern genomes, which has purged introgress sequences that were deleterious in modern humans it also has created what they call gene deserts or, or, or uh, archaic deserts or something like that. It's basically, it's areas where Neanderthal DNA really has been weeded out of modern humans. Indeed, some exceptionally large regions, archaic deserts, that's what they call, uh, uh, depleted of archaic ancestry, also referred to as archaic deserts, have been identified and may be due to selection. So there is also strong evidence that some Neanderthal and Denisovan sequences were beneficial and were rapidly driven to high frequency in modern human populations by a process known as adaptive introgression. This is just old-fashioned a natural selection at work. In general, however, the functional impacts of introgressed sequences, how they have been shaped by selection, and how they've influenced modern human health and disease are only beginning to be explored. So there's lots of room uh, if you are interested in uh, researching this um, to make a, a contribution. Moreover, a consistent observation in all studies of archaic hominin admixture is that East Asian populations have approximately 20% more Neanderthal ancestry compared with Europeans. That's what the literature says. And they're going to discuss why, and it's probably partly artifact. Numerous models have been invoked to explain this difference, including the interaction of demography and selection, dilution by non-admixed populations. Why are Asians more, have more and by the way, it's South Asians as well as East Asians, it's Asians. Um, by non-admixed populations or additional population-specific admixture events, accurately determining variation in Neanderthal ancestry among non-African populations has important implications for refining our understanding of admixture between modern human ancestors and Neanderthals. Despite the methodological progress that has been made to identify introgressed hominin sequences, opportunities for further development of statistical tools abound and may result in novel insights. For example, a recent extension of the S-STAR framework reveals that uh, two waves of Denisovan admixture in East African populations that were not pr previously detectable. So maybe we can, you know, to use different tools and find stuff. And in fact, 
That's what these people have done. To this end, we described a novel method for detecting Neanderthal ancestry in modern humans that does not require an unadmixed reference human panel. So usually you need a you need Neanderthal and you need a non-Neanderthal and then you can compare and you can say, um, uh, but of course if the non-Neanderthal really has Neanderthal, then that's going to throw off your statistics. Um, <coughs> that does not require an admixed reference human panel, which we refer to as IBD mix. We apply IDB mix to genotype data from a large set of modern human individuals from Eurasia, America, and Africa. We make novel discoveries regarding Neanderthal ancestry in Africans and re-examine the relative levels of Neanderthal ancestry in Eurasian populations. We also replicate, extend, and discover new instances of adaptive introgression that may offer insight into human evolution and phenotypic variation in modern humans. Results. Evaluating the power and robustness of ID, IBD mix. Methods that identify introgress Neanderthal lineages in modern humans must differentiate between sequences shared with Neanderthals because of ancient hybridization or because of a shared common ancestor. Which, of course, if you're a creationist, a shared common ancestor is an obvious way of getting that kind of thing. Previous approaches such as S-STAR, CRF, DICAL admix, and HMM uses an unadmixed modern reference panel. In other words, not Neanderthal. So you have Neanderthal and not Neanderthal, commonly an African population such as Yoruba, which is a tribe in Africa that is on the eastern side of Nigeria into Togo and uh, uh, into Benin and Togo. Western Nigeria. Uh, Western what, I'm sorry, you're correct, Western Nigeria. You're absolutely correct. Um, to control for false positive due to shared ancestry by masking putative archaic se sequence present in the reference panel in the target sample. Well, you can see that if your non-Neanderthal has Neanderthal in it, you're going to discount that. If the reference panel carries introgress Neanderthal sequence, this will result in missing Neanderthal sequence in the target sample. IBD mix, which stands for identity by descent calculations, calculates the probabilities that uh, the probabilities that a variant site in a modern individual is and is not shared IBD, the identity by descent, with a reference archaic genome. And if it's not shared identity by descent and it's shared some other way, then, uh, then presumably that's interbreeding. While accounting for genotypic typing errors in the reference archaic and modern human sequences, because you like to say that they're 100%, but everybody knows they're really not. The ratio of these probabilities is used to construct a single site. How big a site? Well, that's arbitrary. They found that 50,000 bases is a good uh, unit to be using. Single site logarithm of odds score, LOD score, which if you're familiar with uh, 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 genetics, that's a standard way of expressing the probability that something happen is happening. And the nice thing about LOD scores is if you add them, you're multiplying the probability. So it makes it very nice because they're logarithms where higher values indicate a greater likelihood that a modern individual's genotype is shared um, identity by descent with the reference archaic genome. And if you have a lower score, then that, that presumably means that uh, it's actually um, uh, interbreeding. Our new method, IBD mix, which is based on identity by descent, does not use a modern reference panel. IBD mix calculates the probabilities that a variant site in a modern individual is and is not shared IBD by descent 
with a reference archaic genome while accounting for genotyping errors in the reference archaic and modern human sequences. The ratio of these probabilities is used to construct a single site a LOD score where higher values indicate a greater, greater likelihood that a modern individual's genotype is shared by descent with the reference archaic genome. IBD Mix uses a dynamic programming algorithm to sum together single site LOD scores and maximize the score in order to identify intergress segments. The false positive rate for IBD Mix is controlled by the LOD score threshold. How, how high a threshold do you have to have? Um, they do a LOD score of four, which is a log of one th uh, 10,000. Um, and length of intergress segments considered, which 50,000 turns out to be a good basis, turns out to be a good one. Unlike existing methods that require phase sequence data, IDB, IBD mix works on unfazed genotype data, making it more com con computationally tractable by avoiding time consuming preprocessing and inaccuracies caused by phasing errors. It should be noted, however, that accurate estimates of allele frequency are required. That means that you have to have a population, you can say 10% of them is uh, type A in this particular gene and 90% and is type B and so forth for all of the variations that you can have. Um, so IBD mix cannot be used on individual genomes or small sample sizes. You can't use one, two, three. After you get past 10, it's pretty reliable. In practice, we found that a minimum of 10 individuals is sufficient for robust inferences. We evaluated IBD mixes uh, performance and operating characteristic using simulated data generated from a previously inferred realistic demographic model and compared it to results using S star. So that basically they created a, their own genome just which they knew exactly uh, whether you know which parts were crossed over by uh, uh, by interbreeding which parts were common ancestor. And so they were able to say, well, this is how it should work. Compared to S-star, IBD, IBD mix has a lower false positive rate and higher power for all intergress sequen uh, uh, segment sizes that are greater than 30 kilobases. Biases may arise in methods that use a modern human reference panel, um, such as the Yorubas as the power to detect intergress sequence will be a function of its presence in the reference panel. We also tested the impact of genetic variation and misspecification of recombination rates on IBD mix using simulated data. Previous studies have identified the intergressing Neanderthal population as a sister clad of the sequenced Altai Neanderthal. In other words, the Altai Neanderthal is pretty close to the average Neanderthal. In summary, IBD mix has higher power and lower FDR. Uh, that's a measure of the, of the false positive rate. Uh, in other words, it can detect uh, 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 cross intergression from uh, Neanderthals and it is less likely to make a mistake if it does that compared to S star and is robust to reference population biases. In the following, unless otherwise noted, we use a LOD score threshold of four, which is a log 10 of four, um, and a minimum, uh, I, I'm sorry, a lo uh, 10 to the fourth is what it is. Uh, uh, for probability and a minimum sequence size of 50 kilobases, which provides a reasonable trade-off between power and false positive rate. Nothing you do is going to be absolutely perfect, but this gives you your most likelihood of success. Um, IBD mix reveals substantial amounts of Neanderthal signal in Africans and nearly uniform levels in non-African populations. 
we applied IABD mix to samples from the Thousand Genomes Project collected from geographically diverse populations and used the Alta Neanderthal reference genome to identify intergressed Neanderthal sequence in these individuals. This is all library work, or more precisely, computer database work. So you could actually do this yourself if you wanted to. After filtering, we identified 110.98 gigabytes of Neanderthal sequence among 2,504 modern individuals. When overlapping intergress segments are merged, some people have the same uh, Neanderthal in them, uh, this equates to 1.29 gigabytes of unique Neanderthal sequence. Because IBD mix does not use a putatively unadmixed modern reference population, we were able to robustly identify regions of apparent Neanderthal sequence in African populations for the first time. Surprisingly, we identified on average 17 megabytes, uh, mega bases, of Neanderthal sequence per individual in the African samples analyzed. And this value was similar across mostly northern African subpopulations represented in the data set, ranging from 1.64 megabytes in individuals in ESN to 18.0 uh, megabytes per individual in LWK. That's pretty even, 16 to 18 uh, megabases. Furthermore, we observed a significant overlap of sequence identified in Africans with that in non-Africans, figure 2b, which I'm going to show you in just a minute. Specifically, of the Neanderthal sequence identified in African samples, more than 94% was shared with non-Africans. So here's the Venn diagram taken from one of the figures. Uh, and you can see that, uh, that there's very little bit of African that does not come from non-African. Very little. We also recovered a substantial amount of Neanderthal sequences in non-African samples across populations. Notably, we found similar levels of Neanderthal ancestry in Europeans, 51 megabytes per uh, megabases per individual. East Asians, 55 megabytes, me megabases per individual. I'm going to keep doing that if I'm not careful and South Asians, 55 megabases per individual. Surprisingly, we observed only a modest enrichment of Neanderthal ancestry in East Asian compared with European individuals. Instead of the usual 20%, they're getting eight. And in fact, um, um, if you keep going, you'll notice that the observed level for East Asian enrichment was even smaller when we were less conservative in our filtering method. So there's some filtering methods they were trying to use to get rid of spurious things. And if you don't try quite so hard, you actually get closer to 3% instead of 8%. This contrasts with the previous reports that have indicated about 20% enrichment of Neanderthal ancestry in East Asians compared with Europeans. And um, remind me to comment uh, if I don't on the reason why it shrinks so much and it's really kind of funny and obvious if you think about it. Back migration with non-Africans and pre-out-of-Africa human to Neanderthal gene flow contributes to apparent Neanderthal ancestry in Africans. Given the unexpectedly large amounts of Neanderthal sequence identified in African individuals, we then next performed analysis to understand their origins. To rule out systematic biases, Let's try a different one. They did the Denisovan sequence in African individuals and only identified 1.2 megabases instead of the 16 to 18 uh, per individual of Denisovan sequence in African samples. This is similar to the amount of Denisovan sequence called in non-African individuals, about one megabase uh, per individual. Uh, and considerably lower than the amount of Neanderthal sequence identified by IDB mix in African individuals. 
We also performed extensive simulations and found that the signal of Neanderthal ancestry in Africans was unlikely to be explained by false positives due to shared ancestry. We next considered two demographic models that could plausibly generate signals of Neanderthal ancestry in Africans. It's there, how do you get there? That are detectable by IDB, IBD mix. Specifically, we studied moder models where non-African individuals who carry Neanderthal sequences inherited from hybridization migrated back to Africa. Um, and Viking invasions. Um, Caucasian slaves being hauled back. I don't know. Um, so that's one model. And models of human to Neanderthal gene flow due to an early pre out of Africa. So the, the, the other model would be sending uh, Africans out before the, the theoretical invasion of, uh, from Africa to uh, Eurasia that got into Neanderthals pre out of Africa dispersion, uh, dispersal of modern humans. We found that IBD mix is sensitive to both back migrations and pre OOA gene flow from modern humans to, ne to Neanderthals. The method could be used for both. We therefore explicitly tested whether putative Neanderthal sequences identified in Africans were more likely to be explained by back migration from non-Africans into Africa or by pre-OOA uh, human to Neanderthal gene flow. To differentiate these scenarios, we compared the empirical data to simulated data, analyzing a variety of sequence characteristics. Skipping over a paragraph, a model that combines both of these events, I'm just giving you the, the summary, elevated back migration and human to Neanderthal gene flow matches the empirical data best across all features. In summary, these data indicate that both pre uh, out of Africa human to hum Neanderthal gene flow and the elevated historic back migration contribute to the signal of Neanderthal ancestry detected in Africans. What that means is there's a lot more migration than people thought. Both from Africa to uh, Neanderthals and from Neanderthals to Africa. Back migration from European ancestors introduced Neanderthal sequences into an, uh, African populations. To further confirm the role of back migration, uh, and again, is that the Vikings coming down and leaving descendants or is that the uh, uh, somebody taking slaves down and, and they being incorporated into the population. Both of those would work. Um, we examined the rates of overlap between called Neanderthal segments and non-African ancestry tracks in African samples. We found that the rate of overlap with European ancestry to be highly significant. Probability is less than one in, what is that, 10,000? Well, the rate of overlap with East Asian ancestry was not significant. So apparently East Asians didn't come back to Africa for whatever reason. These data are consistent with the hypothesis that back migration contributes to signal of Neanderthal ancestry in Africans. Furthermore, the data indicates that this back migration came after the split of Europeans and East Asians from a population re related to the European lineage. Asians went one way, East Asians, Europeans went another way, and they didn't mix too much with each other. Previously inferred differences in Neanderthal ancestry between East Asian Euro and Europeans were biased due to unaccounted for back migration. Previous methods that have relied on unadmixed un modern reference populations, the Yoruba or something like it, like Estar, have reported a greater than 20% enrichment of Neanderthal sequence in East Asians compared with Europeans. However, results from IDB mix show that only 8% enrichment of Neanderthal sequence in East Asians compared with Europeans. And of course that raises a wide the difference. I'm gonna skip over a little bit of that. IBD mix reveals novel insights into signatures of adaptive introgression. I'm gonna skip that one. Uh, IBD mix refines loci de depleted of Neanderthal ancestry. 
um, uh, interesting, but uh, uh, previous analyses have identified large, greater than 10 megabases autosomal regions of the genome that are significantly depleted of Neanderthal ancestry in all African populations. A Africans and Neanderthals are completely different there uh, and, and other populations. These large deserts of archaic intergrace sequence appeared at frequencies greater than expected under neutral models, probably selected out. Discussion. We developed a novel approach to identify an in intergressed hominin sequence that persists in the genome of modern humans and we show that it performs well comparing, compared to existing methods. The main novelty of IVD mix is that compared to previous methods it does not use an unadmixed reference pan panel, which means you don't have to say not Neanderthal. As such we were able to make unbiased inferences about signals of Neanderthal ancestry in African populations which are a combination of genuine intergress Neanderthal sequences and human sequences present in the Neanderthal genome. We also demonstrate that back migrations to Africa confounded previous estimates of variations in Neanderthal ancestry among non-African populations. Furthermore, we combined a confirmed and refined genomic region significantly depleted of Neanderthal ancestry as well as putative targets of adaptive intergression, including several loci that were previously not detectable when using an African reference population. It is important to note, however, that IBD mix has several limitations. In particular, IBD mix requires an archaic reference genome and therefore is not suitable for discovering intergress sequence from unknown or unsequenced hominin lineages, which apparently can be done with some of those other methods. IABD mix also requires that populations be analyzed separately and that a sufficiently large sample size be used in order to robustly estimate population allele frequencies and how they're stacked along the genome, by the way. Um, that's why the LOD scores. Uh, to sign LOD scores and to determine IBD. Sig uh, simulations suggest a minimum of 10 individuals and they show uh, some statistics for that. I additionally, recombination rate heterogeneity across the genome and between populations can influence IBD mix segment size cutoffs. Consequently, it will be difficult to apply IBD mix to individual genomes or ancient human samples. You've got to have at least 10 people in order to make it work. Um, well, at least, where the sample size is limited and estimates of allele frequencies and recombination rates are imprecise. So if we discover that Flory's man has a genome that we can tap into, um, there's only like about eight individuals, it's not going to be helpful with this method. As such, IBD mix complements existing approaches for identifying intergressed sequences in modern humans. Applying IBD mix to geographically diverse populations revealed two unexpected observations. First, we discovered a stronger than expected signal of Neanderthal ancestry among African individuals. Specifically, among the 1,000 genomes African populations, we had identified approximately 17 megabytes of putative Neanderthal se sequence per individual, whereas previous inferences found considerably less than a megabyte, ranging from 0 0.026 to 0 0.05 megabytes. Even early diverging groups like the Khoisan, that's pygmies in South Africa, have up to 30% ancestry from recent admixture with East Africans and Eurasians. So they're not all by themselves. Therefore, it will not be surprising if Neanderthal ancestry due to back migrations is, pregnant, pardon me, is present at varying levels across the African continent. Our results also prove strong evidence that human sequence in the Neanderthal genome also contributes to the signal of Neanderthal ancestry we detect in Africans. In other words, it goes both ways. 
The second major insight afforded by IBD mix is that levels of Neanderthal ancestry among non-African populations are more uniform than previous estimates. Specifically, as opposed to the 20% enrichment of Neanderthal sequences previously found in East Asians compared with Europeans, we only find approximately 8% enrichment. And the reason for that is all of those stuff that were, that where you saw Africans overlapping with Europeans, that got subtracted out of the previous estimates. So it didn't, it looked like Europeans had less Neanderthal ancestry because they weren't counting the stuff that matched Europeans, Africans, and uh, Neanderthals. In summary, our data show that out of Africa and into Africa dispersals must be accounted for when interpreting archaic hominin ancestry in contemporary human populations. It is notable that Neanderthal sequences have been identified in every contemporary modern human genome analyzed to date. We are all part Neanderthal. Thus the legacy of gene flow with Neanderthals likely exists in all modern humans, highlighting our shared history. Now, my take on all this, the first method of determining Neanderthal content of genomes contrasted it with an African standard. Thus, almost by definition, there could not be Neanderthal DNA in the standard, and thus probably most African DNA if they match the standard closely enough. Um, and this is one of the things I found interesting when I was reading it, that, that, that was an obvious assumption that could be wrong. The methodology was clearly flawed, but may have been the best uh, available at the time. Apparently was. Um, now there is a way to avoid that pitfall. It is not clear to me what other pitfalls it, the, this new method may not avoid as the method of determining whether modern humans gave DNA or vice versa is not clear to me how you know this one went into the Neanderthal from the human and that one came from the Neanderthal to the human. I'm not sure how you can be sure of that, but the supplement did not make the method clear to me either. And maybe that's because um, I'm slow. Maybe it's because they didn't write well. Maybe it's because the methodology is a little vague. I don't know. But if the method is reasonably sound, it appears that Africans do share DNA with Neanderthals. And in some cases, apparently, uh, by some kind of migration, whether intentional or forced is not clear. There appears to be a case, uh, this is outside of what we've discussed so far, of a Neanderthal mating with a Denisovan and producing a hybrid that's precisely half Denisovan and half Neanderthal. The data needs to be gone over carefully by someone who considers short age creationism a theoretically possible hypothesis. I don't think it needs to be gone over necessarily by a creationist, but it needs to be gone over by somebody who doesn't rule creationism out to start with. We might be surprised by what we find, but that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Go ahead. When, you refer, when, they, when they refer back to a sort of baseline African population, is this Eve? No, it's the Yoruba. Uh, I mean, the baseline African population for the other methods. This one doesn't refer to a, a this one only takes the, the modern genomes project, mm -hmm. thousand genomes project which is now 2,504, I think, in counting. Um, and basically says we have, you know, 50 Yorubas and we have 25 whatever other tribe and then, you know, and, and there, there are five identified tribes in Africa that, that have been incorporated into the data. And so they're, they're looking at those tribes kind of as a unit and saying what are the frequencies of their, uh, of 
uh, variant A and variant B. And in fact, they go on to say that if there's five variants, they can't do this. Um, although I think they probably could if they were to adapt their mathematics carefully enough. But, um, and then they compare it with the Altai uh, Neanderthal, a woman with a toe in Siberia. Altai Mountains, by the way, in case you're wondering where in the world Altai came from. And, uh, and, and so they're saying, well, this stuff matches, and it matches for 50,000, matches for 100,000 bases, whatever, whatever it is, um, close enough for statistics. But isn't it, it true that the, pardon me, <laughs> Isn't it true that the Denisovan population, so-called, is based on two or three individuals in one cave? My understanding was that they have found some people in Georgia that, that is like a whole family of like 13 or something like that. I, I went back and looked it up, and it seemed to infer that the, all of the samples had been found in one cave, uh, which was carried with the, the Denisovan and for some reason as a name. Yeah. And Probably then, from Denisova uh, some uh, in you know some Russian name or Ukrainian name or whatever it is, Georgia. Sure. But it seemed like it was a very very s slim, almost scanty sample to make big 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 comparisons on. Well, yeah, it, certainly compared with Neanderthals, it's quite uh, a small sample. Yeah. Uh, then I'm, I've been struggling, and I don't mean to take this in a totally different direction, but how do you get that much change or degeneration in human populations over the short time period we talk about since human creation? Is it possible there was more than one pair of humans created in different parts of the world? Well, it's, I mean, I, I that's don't want to sound too radical here, but there's yeah. some questions that need to be thought about. Yeah. Well, the, I mean, there, there are two ways of going. Uh, I think if you're doing a creationism, it's really hard to make more than Adam and Eve. I think that that's kind of, yes. you're, you're stuck with that if you're going to be a, a biblical creationist. I think that there is the possibility that uh, Noah wasn't the only human that that survived. Some other people survived on rafts or on, uh, you know, they call it refugia. I think sometimes, and it and and we may need to take that uh, into account because I think that. You know, it depends on how you view the, the biblical record, but as I view it, people are describing what they saw. All the high mountains that they could see were covered. Um, and everything that they knew of died. But then if they spread out from there and they found somebody else who'd somehow made it through, either from their own boat or from some other way of doing it, then, and maybe they met them in the, in the South Sea Islands or something, you know. it's. Um, that's something I could buy without necessarily doing total violence to the text uh, as a description. And I have to do the text as a description because otherwise I have real problems with Joshua's long day. Not so much the day itself as Joshua commanding the sun to stand still. And I have to say he was describing that phenomenologically, not as a, uh, 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 not as an ontological phenomenon. Because sure. if you do an ontological phenomenon, then we're going to be stuck with a non-rotating Earth, which is really hard to maintain it. Now, are, are these finds, Neanderthal and Denisovan or whatever, contemporaneous with the records of sophisticated culture in the Middle East? The sophisticated culture is generally speaking dated less. Is what? 
dated less time than the Denisovans. So more recent. Um, now, I'm going to be really cautious about saying that because I'm not sure that the um, that the dating methods that are being used are as good as people are cracking them up to be. And I say that from some study in the area. Uh, and if you think a little bit about it, that would fit the stuff you've just gone over as well. Yeah. Trying to put uh, an actual origin time on it. Yeah. Um, but the other possibility that I think we have to keep in mind is that the mutation rate may not have always been constant. And in fact, there are physiologic reasons to believe that it might have been faster in the past than it is now. Specifically, uh, if you put all of the uh, Phenerozoic deposits in the flood, in, in the during the flood, or shortly thereafter, which I think is not an unreasonable position, then we have some pretty good evidence that magnetic field has fluctuated wildly during that time period and some of the time it actually went down to zero as it was crossing from positive to negative and vice versa which means that the Van Allen belts all of the shielding that is normally keeps us from getting nearly as many cosmic rays as we normally would was down at some point and it would make a certain amount of sense that we would have more radiation during those time periods and possibly more radiation damage for humans. Now, of course, if you want to go in a slightly different direction, you can say, and there was accelerated radioactivity during some of this time, and some of that may have contributed. <laughs> but, uh, you know, yeah, so I, I, not, not wanting to say for sure whether that's how it worked or not, but I think it is it is fair to say that we need to be careful about saying, oh, the mutation rate has always been exactly the way it is today. I think that's the kind of blind uniformitarianism that, that may not be warranted. And in fact, in other areas has been disproven. Um, the channeled scab lands were not done by slow wind water er erosion. It was done by rather massive flooding and possibly within the space of somewhere like two days. In which case, uh, the, the mechanisms that I've described except for accelerated radioactivity are actually perfectly uh, physically understandable ones. You know, more cosmic rays, more, more radiation damage. Um, and, um, and of course there may have been rather significant changes due to uh, the standard diet um, that, uh, you know, Ellen White speaks about that as being a cause for dying early. Well, could it have also caused uh, a genetic damage? Maybe. So, um, I think it, we need to be really careful about uh, uh, about making assumptions that feel good if you're a uniformitarian, but may not necessarily be warranted. Understood. Yes. For that uh, this so-called return of uh, Neanderthal DNA to Africa could not be relict DNA that was there and lost to the general population later on. Uh, but not all lost. No. Uh, maybe the, maybe the, the Neanderthals are actually better than we are. Uh, the fact that we have gene desert or, or archaic deserts suggests that not all of the changes in Neanderthal were good doesn't prove it, but it does make one wonder. And of course, if one wanted to be totally callous about one's fellow man, 
one could uh, recreate Neanderthal DNA, stick it into somebody and see how they did. I, I, I it's not hard to associate degeneration of Neanderthal. It's not hard to what? Associate degeneration of Neanderthal. Yeah. And, and, and the other thing is it may have been a mixed bag where they were better than us in some ways and worse than us in some ways. And that, um, uh, that maybe the net result was worse, which is why pure Neanderthals died out. But that in some ways they were better, and so when, we're, when there's back and forth crossing, that the good parts tended to get saved and the bad parts tended to get lost. One of the things that would be interesting is to ask how much acceleration of uh, uh, mutation would be required to account for the changes in Neanderthals versus standard modern humans, be they African, Asian, or European? Are you suggesting radiation, excessive radiation? as a, uh, it's something occurring at the time of the flood? Yeah, the other thing that may have happened is that for a while after the flood our diet was not very good because we had to eat whatever we could find and we wound up eating plants that were toxic and were specifically toxic. I mean, uh, there are plants that actually do poison, uh, periwinkle being one of them, uh, the uh, 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 the process of mitosis and meiosis, which of course are uh, really, uh, you know, deleterious to, to trying to continue DNA without changes. So uh, there's just a whole bunch of questions that I don't think we're going to know the answers to. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I think that it's important for us to realize that um, the truth of the matter is everybody has a certain amount of faith and they have certain assumptions that they just kind of take for granted and then they go from there. And, you know, long age is one, common ancestry is another. Uh, in this particular case, I think we would affirm common ancestry of Denisovan's um, uh, Neanderthals and modern humans. Uh, but the time frame we I think might have different um, suspicions as to the correct uh, time frame. And once you do that then, you, then it throws a bunch of extra variables into the equation. At a hundred mutations per generation, can that at all fit into the figure of the changes we see here? Or do we have to assume that uh, Adam and Eve had very different genomes that somehow started it? Uh, that is a good question. And I don't know of anybody who has the exact answer to it. Now the closest that I can get is that there, there's some indication that there are five basic um, uh, histocompatibility loc locus antigens, HLA, and a little tweaks on each one. Um, and in fact, one of them may be a tweak of one of the four, in which case it may very well be that we were created completely heterozygous deliberately. Um, I find it fascinating that if you're going to have Adam and Eve and everybody else descended from them, that four is the maximum you can have and that, you know, five of which one is closer to the other four um, actually is a pretty good fit. And certainly doesn't, uh, it's easier to buy that than it is to try to buy that somehow 
we lucked into that kind of a picture uh, with 10,000 humans all at any one given time. Uh, one of the things I was just reading uh, that's just coming out now, uh, or, or actually has been coming out but just got into science as a kind of a notification thing, is that um, the Netherlands has been dredging up stuff from the North Sea and dumping it on, the, on their um, uh, shores with the intention of uh, keeping the water from overflowing the Netherlands because as everybody knows the sea is supposed to be rising and we're going to drown if we don't do something about it. Um, and uh, so well, when they're going out to the North Sea they're grabbing this stuff and throwing it onto the onto the coast and lo and behold they're finding all kinds of human artifacts suggesting that at one time which is standard theory by the way the water level was quite a bit lower and you could walk between uh, France and England and that in fact there's I think we went over once where it looks like uh, the um, English Channel was actually torn out by a giant flood of the uh, Brett's variety. Which is why the coastlines are sharp cliffs that go down to the water. Yeah, I think we need to study this right. Uh, I do find it fascinating that phenotypic changes can be extremely rapid. Uh, and I've seen various kinds of dogs and all this stuff. Uh, that is true. But uh, does this get into the quantity stuff these guys are into? Uh, I'd like to see that. Well, you know, what would be really interesting to do is to branch out from humans and start asking questions that we might otherwise like ask about dogs. Dingoes are apparently dogs. I don't know for sure because I don't know that anybody's actually tried it, but I would be willing to bet that they can be interbred with other dogs. And um, um, that the same thing is true of African honey dogs and um, presumably the you know crossbreeding between those two is pretty minimal. And then we have wolves of various kinds. We have North American wolves. We have you know Eurasian wolves. We have um, and it would be interesting to ask the exact same questions that people are asking about the human populations of the dogs. Uh, I don't know whether we have a thousand dogs genomes, you know, and if we can say, I, I think we're getting to the point where we can say that pit bulls have a certain general genome and that German Shepherds have another genome and, and so forth. And, and of course, there's all kinds of mixes between the various dog breeds as well, getting back to the mutts, you know. Uh, but that's one of the things that would be interesting to, to go over. Uh, it, and it may be that if we, do, if we develop methodologies that are sound for the dogs, and then we reapply that to humans that we may find some very interesting facts. And it may be that we will, we will be able to say, you know what, there's been a lot of mutation and it's worse in Africa than it is anywhere else or something like that, you know. And then all of a sudden a lot of things that, that would otherwise puzzle us would go, okay, that makes sense now. Like for instance, you know, the Y chromosome in humans in Africa is more divergent than it is anywhere else. Is that because Africa was where we had humans and humans and more humans for longer and longer periods of time? And then finally one group went out and created the European and Asian groups? Or is it more like um, actually some, some parts of Africa have worse mutations? And so what you're looking at is um, uh, you know, more rapid evolution uh, or devolution, depending on how you want to count it. Um, maybe both. Um, in 
in a population that is in a more mutagenic environment? Uh, and those are questions that we really should be starting to ask ourselves, I think, if we're going to be getting into uh, genetics. If you're dealing with degeneration, you're not constrained by the survival of the fittest constraints? Well, you're partly constrained. A little bit, but... If you, if you don't, if, if it won't work at all, then you don't have kids, period. Yeah. But at least, at least you're not uh, forced into uh, yeah. those extreme situations right. for survival. Comment? Your thoughts on Noah's flood, some people might have survived on the raft after some, would you? I, I, okay, <laughs> personally, I bet against it. Yeah. But I'm not going to say it couldn't possibly happen. Could it? I mean, when it says all creation was destroyed. Well, you see, it depends. How, how, did, how was the Genesis 6 through 9 written? Was Genesis 6 through 9 something that God said to, oh, I don't know, Moses? Moses. And said, okay, write this. All flesh was destroyed. Or was it the experiences of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, who after the flood, perhaps more Shem than anybody else, collected the stories, put them together, made, and, and just describing what they saw? Yeah, then the question really comes up, what was the purpose uh, of the flood? You well, know, the purpose uh, of the flood was to wipe out all of mankind. Right. So some guys were smarter, so this is what we're going to build this raft. But, well, <laughs> or, or the possibility is there was another Noah out there somewhere that actually was righteous as well. Um, I, I, you know, like I say, I'm, I'm not betting on it. I'm just right. saying if you're, if you're developing uh, hypotheses, it's better to brainstorm, so to speak, sure, and then and then eliminate stuff as it doesn't fit, rather than rather than starting out and saying I know what it is and we won't look outside our little box. I, I'm saying look outside the box. Fine, see if you find it. If it fits, fine. If it doesn't fit, well, you know, I guess the box is pretty good. And that means that the box is now confirmed by science. And see that's. That's what happens with most of science, really, if you think about it. Uh, Newton didn't start out by saying, you know, it's got to fit by this theory of gravity I have. But rather, he said, you know, we have all of these observations, and if you accept gravity this way, it makes sense of all the observations. The observations are key. The theory is actually secondary. Just, so we'll, 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 get, we'll let you go. Uh, the, the, the Lord has given us enough in here for our salvation. Perhaps there is going to be a time when we can really look into it, it, but have we been given enough for our salvation? I think that's the most basic question. That includes even Hezekiah's, I think that was him saying, change the dial, the shadow of the... Was yeah, it was yeah. Right, and then of course the uh, the longest day <laughs> really Joshua's mm -hmm, day. Mm -hmm. uh, th 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 there may not be an answer right now, but there is an answer. You see, so the question really is: Have we been given enough evidence to trust in Him? Well, that that's um, I think that's a good question, but I I do think that you know. Maybe some of us need more, more evidence, you know. Uh, but if that's the case, God, God says to Gideon, okay, so what do you want? He says, well, I want the fleece to be uh, dry and the, and the ground to be wet. And uh, so God says, okay, fine. And he says, well, you know, maybe that's just the way it is. And, we, you know, it's natural. Why don't you do it the uh, reverse? So God says, okay. And the next morning he rings out the fleece and it's just soaked. You know, so it's, um, uh, God does condescend to our need for some kind of uh, confirmation, at least some of the time. 
Does it say in Genesis how deep the water was over the highest peak? It does. That it's, seems it's to 15 be 15 cubits, 22 and a half feet. Fairly specific information. I, I just have, so, have an interesting thought that we, we really have no reason to not believe the plain account in Genesis yeah. other than that we have this scientific data that is pushing us to begin questioning it. Yeah, but uh, see, the one thing I don't like is selective hyper-skepticism, okay? You put, the, you put the Bible under that kind of a microscope. Well, if you do that, then you better put science under the same kind of microscope. So are we that sure of the data sets that it could lead us to make a really big conclusion that the, the water didn't really cover the highest peak by a certain amount? I don't think that we've gotten there yet. And I think that my first inclination is to say I'm going to believe what it says first until it's proven otherwise rather than the reverse. That's not a fundamentalist position, but it's a conservative one. Go ahead. Along that line, um, <laughs> we have no record of the death of sea-dwelling organisms during the flood. No way to save them. And if they were all going to die as a result of the flood, we wouldn't have anything. That's right, and obviously that didn't happen. And to expect the record to talk to us now with a much more sophisticated background would have meant for millennia no one would read it and believe it because it simply would not make sense. Well, again, you ask yourself, how is the Bible written? What was it written for? And I think one of the points was that, you know, left to itself with no check on evil. Because remember, God took Cain and said, okay, you're afraid that somebody's going to kill you like you killed your brother? Don't worry. I got that one covered. So what did Cain do when he was, had reassurance that he wasn't going to die? He went out and built the city, and uh, he and his descendants slowly, de uh, maybe rapidly, uh, de degenerated to the point where, uh, you know, you, you, you show your middle finger to me and I'll kill you. You know, it's like, I, I, you know, you kill me for, I'll kill you for insulting me. That's that's what it came down to. Um, and obviously taking two wives and probably having whatever he wanted on the side too. And I mean, it's like, you know, might makes right and I'm the biggest, so guess what? Tough luck for you. Um, and with no principle of, you know what, we're going to, we're going to try to control this. Uh, society just degenerated to the point where God had to say, well, this guy and maybe his family, we'll, we'll take him. Even this guy wasn't too good. He went out and got drunk. But at least, you know, he, he, had, he had some standards. Um, and it's interesting when, uh, when God is coming, uh, you know, renewing everything to Noah, he says, now, it's going to be different this time. Somebody kills, they get killed. No more of this Cain stuff. My own personal theory is that God is showing that good and evil cannot coexist. They cannot coexist while good tries to be good all the time. They cannot coexist while good is trying to control evil. They cannot even coexist where you have some people whose job it is to, to uh, police others and other people are trying to, uh, trying to live their life normally. Uh, the, no system of government can make it work. Even the American one. And I think that what we're seeing 
as time goes on is kind of the living out of that principle. Just wait. And when the experiment has been run, and one of the things that we can say is good and evil cannot coexist together, then when God pulls good people together, or good enough at least to, to listen to God, because um, we have to be careful about calling ourselves good too, there's no one good but God alone. Um, but he will pull people who are committed to him and, uh, away from the other people and he will be able to say to the universe, look, there's no point in even having these other people in our kingdom because they don't want it anyway and they'll mess it up. Uh, but, but that's the message now, would that message be destroyed if there was some seafaring Australasian, you know, Oceania uh, that somehow made it through? Uh, maybe, maybe not. But let's wait and see. Um, I'm, a, I'm willing to, to entertain it as a hypothesis. I'm, I don't think it's my preferred hypothesis at this point. There's no other way to make the data fit without having a, an extra Noah somewhere. Are there other factors that we haven't considered? Well, there there are two possibilities. One of them is that it is an extra Noah somewhere, um, which would account for flood th uh, stories because they both went through the flood. Um, the other possibility that you keep in mind is that if mutations happen fast enough to get us from uh, humans to Denisovans, or maybe half human, half Denisovan to Denisovans, uh, there is the possibility that uh, that rapid, uh, rapid mutation rate could have produced for, you know, so that the Australasians could conceivably be part of the uh, uh, part of the split after the flood. I, I heard a theory that maybe there was more cosmic rays reaching the Earth's surface after the time of the flood due to yeah. major atmospheric changes. You just heard changes. that here too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I don't know if, that is, if that's enough to account for uh, an increased mutation rate. Maybe. And, and, afterwards. and we're gonna, the truth of the matter is unless we have a video we're not going to be able to say for sure. Um, if everything fits the kind of uh, first pass take at the Bible, then it makes sense to just say, oh, well, that's probably right. Even then we might be wrong. There might have been, you know, two people that, uh, that, uh, that matched each other pretty well and, and whose genomes flowed together. So, you know, until God tells us for sure, we won't know for sure. So but far I vote for one Noah. So far I vote for one Noah also. <laughs> so what would two Noahs do? Well, one of, them, the one of them could have dark skin and kinky hair and, and be the, uh, the uh, Papua New Guinea uh, people. So and, the, and the Australian Aborigines and, you know, so all of a sudden you don't have... Uh, see, you can make the three sons of Noah into Shem being mostly East Asians. And, and some South Asians probably too, but South Asians are probably Caucasian as much as anything else. Um, and then the Europeans, in fact the Europeans are pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that they belong because there's actually a, um, uh, there's some uh, uh, king lists that go back and they go back to Japheth. So that one, I kind of, you know, you can kind of say Europeans are probably Japhethites. So. Which destroys the British Israel theory, but <clears throat> anyway. Real, real quick, um, we need multiverses to help uh, evolution fit its theories. Now yes. we need uh, a multi Noah's. Uh, I'm having a hard time with that one. 
<laughs> well, <laughs> you know, uh, one of the things that should be done, somebody should sit down and go through all of the stuff and be, you know, maybe we'll be able to say, you know, if you throw in a little Denisovan to the, to the South Sea Islanders, uh, suddenly you can get them out of East Asians. Uh, I don't know. Uh, there's a whole bunch of questions that don't have answers. I'm happy, in fact, I'm happy to start out with saying, well, maybe it was evolution to begin with, and then say, no, but it doesn't fit here, it doesn't fit here, it doesn't fit here, it doesn't fit here. You know, that theory just won't, won't wash. I'm more comfortable doing that than saying, the Bible says it, and I believe it, and that settles it, and I'm just not going to even listen to those guys. They're just wrong. Because I think our schools ought to do it your way instead of just ignoring it until yeah, I, we start losing our children. I, I agree wholeheartedly, obviously. Uh, but, uh, yeah, because if you do it the other way, then when you discover this, it's all this uh, body of literature, and you've never heard any arguments against it, and you've never, uh, I mean, you're suddenly, and they didn't tell me? And there's a really big tendency to just dump the whole thing. And especially if you're an adolescent and you think your parents don't know very much anyway. <laughs> uh, comment here and there. Go ahead. Well, I, uh, a couple of minutes ago I mentioned sea-dwelling organisms. There simply is no concern expressed in any inspired writings about what happened to them. But we, they we were made, but we, we but like to think that all of the non-created organisms died in the flood. But the majority of organisms were sea dwelling, and it's not even addressed. And the sea was there. Yeah, yeah. Let's face it. So the Bible is an anthropocentric uh, uh, document. And I, I would just comment further. I can, from experience, if you want to make a very clear, it's this and not that with these kind of questions. You're talking about informed Adventist young people. That's the fastest way to lose them. You think of it my way, or goodbye. So, so you're approving we, of my. Saying, well, here's one possibility, here's another possibility, well, here's well, the evidence Well, of course, for as, them. as long as, as they see faith in inspiration and in Scripture, and yet the understanding that it wasn't designed to answer all these other questions that we ask now, at least I saw that work, that approach work for decades. I, I think it works better than the, than the, than the, uh, then the bumper sticker, God says, I believe it, that exactly. does it, if you're um, not careful. In my experience, I can give you chapter and verse on that. Yeah. Comment. Uh, sometimes uh, I think we can shift into rationalism and make that the God. Uh, I tend to, to totally agree with you that uh, there's sufficient scientific evidence out there that uh, we have to reject the evolutionary model. Mm -hmm. uh, the alternate model seems more reasonable because it answers more of my scientific questions. It doesn't answer all of them. Yeah, uh, and, and there may be some tweaks on that model. Uh, definitely, but uh, I think there's, uh, I'm a little uncomfortable with too many no's around here. Uh, <laughs> uh, the Bible is so uh, all-inclusive in its description of the flood. Uh, you're, you're, I, I, I share your discomfort. Uh, yeah. I, I'm not saying, Right. What I'm saying, you though, is that if you're looking at it from a scientific point of view, it is a hypothesis. You have to consider it, and it's not a hypothesis that would totally destroy biblical authority. But having said that, I, you know, if I, if I have to say something, I, I would prefer to take it 
pretty much straightforwardly. And Christ seemed to refer to one flood. Uh, right. I suppose that you could have a dozen Noahs in one flood. Yeah. But uh, and and I think that if, in, if from the biblical perspective, from a the theological perspective, you really have a hard time making more than one Adam. You can maybe it, get away uh, with one Noah, but no, not one Adam. I mean, more than one Adam. Yeah. I think you're stuck with that. Yeah. Well, I'm not completely happy with one Noah, with more than one Noah. <laughs> I'm not either. But. <laughs> Anyway, so um, we'll, we'll find something to do next week. It looks like the 22nd, which is what, two weeks from today, we may be able to have uh, um, uh, Warren Johns come back and uh, he's going to do some stuff with the Exodus. I, I feel like that's an area where maybe not science in the strict sense, uh, but certainly history uh, interacts with the Bible and... and uh, what? Was it too cold back then? I don't know. He just said he was coming uh, that day and said, uh, would I be interested? So I'm interested. So. <laughs> <laughs>